Today, I will talk about why your game changer uh, will fail. First of all, we have to quickly get the landscape. And this is the drag discovery process in front of you. It starts from target validation, where we're finding appropriate target for our new prospective drug. Then we screen compounds, optimize compounds, do preclinical testing on cells, and then three phases of um, studies on people. And then if uh, the third phase is successful, the drug uh, is approved after some time and then uh, can be repurposed to market. <laughs> so uh, usually delivery of uh, one drug to market uh, takes 15 years, like from 12 to 18. And uh, today's cost um, average is uh, $2.6 billion. But it is expected that drug discovery market will grow exponentially and uh, its size will be 71 billion in uh, 2025. Uh, according to the previous picture, the overall clinical trials uh, failure rate is 90%. It means um, only 10% of um, compounds which uh, end the phase three and was not filtered earlier, only 10% of them uh, come to market. So it is um, incredibly high failure rate. Nowadays, only 12% of uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies use AI technologies. Uh, it means they are not widely adopted yet. Moreover, we have um, 150 drugs delivered with AI assistance uh, on these stages, like three early stages. And we have 15 drugs which were designed with AI in clinical trial stages. Uh, it means phase one, phase two, phase three. And what conclusions can we do? Uh, is that we are at the dawn of a new era in drug discovery. It is obvious then AI and drug discovery gives real results. And when I say real results, it means therapeutic molecules. But enterprises are slow due to operational overload and they cannot innovate quickly. That's a typical problem of all enterprise. They have like directors of directors and then directors of directors. Then they have senior directors, um, vice presidents, uh, presidents, head of departments and all that shit, I apologize, it makes the corporate terribly slow. So it never um, over compete smaller companies. So right now uh, is the time of small and fast startups. Later, usually startups uh, will be bought and integrated by enterprises. And as usually they often fail to integrate them, but this is a different story. So what are we going to talk about today? We will talk about four deadly scenes of AI projects in drug discovery. First is hype. Second, incompetent directors. Third, loud names and low quality technologies. And fourth is bad data. First, chapter number one, hype. Um, almost everybody, um, each one of you heard things like AI is the game changer, AI is the future, AI like will solve everything. Like let's take this data, put it into the neural network, it will do the trick. Or let's add AI in the pipeline and uh, it will solve your problem. Like so, and uh, companies uh, which claim themselves to be like AI powered. Uh, get investments fast because people are very um, expired um, with uh, like new fancy technologies. But um, uh, the reality, uh, the reality is that uh, is not that good. Um, never be like, uh, oh, uh, like don't don't uh, cheat yourself. AI uh, is uh, just a tool. 
uh, AI has limited uh, applicability. It uh, takes years to master uh, this tool. It's like you, um, after, after these years, you know where to apply it and where you shouldn't apply it, what can it do and what it can't. And uh, moreover, uh, AI is limited by environment and uh, limited by data. So 90% of success in any AI project is, um, is data. It depends on the quality, quantity, and data preparation and feature engineering. Without that, um, I would say that it will be impossible to uh, succeed in any project. So chapter number two is incompetent directors. Um, here is a bit uh, complicated picture, but uh, it uh, mirrors the typical structure uh, of enterprise. Or, or how a new idea or project or venture is deployed. Uh, first of all, a CEO uh, or any like major executive has an idea. CEO has an idea because he like spent like 10, 20, 30 years in the field. He knows all the intricacies, all ins and outs and see opportunity. So having seen the opportunity, he generates the idea how this problem can be addressed. Yeah, and it, okay, he see the opportunity, but typically uh, those executives, they simply, they understand, they understand the matter, they understand the technology, they understand the limitations, um, the needs, the market, they have like, they understand all of it, but <clears throat> they don't have time to manage it. They don't have time to sit and implement they even don't have time to manage the tech team or other teams because it, they're simply overwhelmed with, uh, uh, with activities. So that's how they decide to hire directors, a set of directors to whom uh, the CEO's responsibility of the implementation of the idea will be delegated. And uh, this is how these uh, technical directors are hired. This is oversimplified picture, but um, it shows you the essence uh, of issue. So, uh, so here are hired directors. We hired uh, our technical director, we hired sales director, and we hired science director. So science director will be responsible for uh, scientific part, like for chemistry, biology, pharmaceutics, um, physics, um, all the stuff uh, which is needed from the domain point of view. Uh, of course, and, and it is typically that biologists and chemists, they are not uh, good coders. So this uh, science, uh, and as well, they don't have appropriate education. They don't know like a commit practices. They don't know, um, how the code must be organized, uh, how you do web, what is the back end, front end, uh, what is the three layer architecture, multi tenant architecture, what are the pros and cons and stuff. Nobody expects from them that uh, deep knowledge of these matters. So the, a second director is hired, and this is a technical director. This technical director came from a pure software, typically again, uh, from a pure software development environment. He knows how to manage small teams, big teams, uh, multiple teams. Mm. He knows when you should uh, choose Python, when Java, uh, what architecture uh, and stuff. Um, he's, he, he, he been through all the career ladder, like started from junior engineer and senior architect. And now he is a technical director capable both of uh, managing software development teams and has some solid understanding of technologies. Um, and then, of course, we have to sell our product. So we hire sales uh, director who is responsible for promotion, marketing, and sales team. Uh, now all these people, and it is generally thought that this set of people, they can cover all the areas which are needed and to successfully deliver the product of which 
a CEO had an idea. But all parts are good and all parts can do their job. But when it comes to the interaction, science director, for example, given questions to which he simply doesn't know how to answer. For example, technical director, he has no idea what are the structure of proteins, how they are stored, for example, what is smiles, what are smarts, when you use that, when you use extended fingerprints, when you use neural fingerprints, he has no idea, no bad idea of that. But he wants to know how to store them, for example, because he wants to choose the database, right? So he goes to a science director and asks him, hey, I need to build a data model, right, to store our data. Is our data structured or unstructured? And science director responds, hey, we have PDB files. PDB files, okay. Technical director, not okay. He doesn't know what are PDB files, what are the structure, coordinates, what is the content and stuff, see? Um, so by essence, science director cannot assist and cannot interact efficiently with the technical director because he doesn't know basics of computer science. He doesn't know what is the transactional database, uh, what is the analytical database, should their schema be Inman like a Kimball. He just, um, he, his mind get, gets blank. He knows chemistry, he knows biology, yeah, right? Then technical director, as a result of a communication with a science director, he came out with no idea of what he is going to deliver, right? Uh, he, he got a lot of information like, okay, we have to take into account diastereomers and tautomers, but what is it? He has no bare understanding, right? While these words are very familiar for science directors, this is some abracadabra for technical director. And it remains such. So they had a conversation. Now we forgot about the third director. It's a sales director. He has to sell something, right? Sales director is usually very active people. They uh, start to make a lot of calls and um, emails or cold, hot meetings, like uh, hitting doors on LinkedIn um, and stuff. Most likely and most often, they just reuse set of tools which they like familiar with. They take their old tools to the new job and they try, try to apply and try to sell the product, okay? So everything was fine with sales until this time. The problem is that sales don't understand what he is going to sell. He doesn't understand what this thing does. Who should he going to speak to with? About what? What is his uh, ideal customer profile and stuff? He doesn't know how it works. He doesn't know what the tool does. It all results in uh, many efforts spent uh, without any result. So imagine a sales director did like a thousand attempts uh, like to sell this month, but unfortunately they resulted in uh, zero pre-sales, like nothing, nobody interested because he even failed uh, to explain uh, uh, to his prospect <laughs> what this thing for. This is not a joke. Um, this is a real situation, by the way. Uh, like, hey, I heard there is a hype. Let me sell. Let me sell your stuff. Okay. Do you know what you're going to sell? No, you say me. Mm, nice. <clears throat> so uh, we took into account only directors. And in my opinion, the error, the all failure of the system begins here because these people then tasked to uh, gather the teams that will do uh, low level tasks, right? And th they've been asked 
to do um, job description and hire, you hire five people, you hire four people, um, science director don't hire people, like you alone will do the trick because he's just the advisor. <laughs> and uh, okay, hiring people, doing job description is fine. This is what they know how to do. And they do it in a month or two, they create job description, create teams. See, now the uh, technical director created under him development team and sales director created PR marketing and sales team under him. Did it help? Of course, no. Because these people initially didn't know what they are going to do. So they hired people. They gave them the tasks which sell told to them. As we know, SEO gave them high level task, right? Which is um, macro management, macro management. You tell, I need um, a, a, a life science platform which stores this kind of data and does this kind of thing. This is a macro management. These instructions uh, were given to uh, directors, these directors. But since they don't have deep understanding of the matter, they failed to decompose these macro commands to micromanagement. So once they created their teams under them, now they have to explain to the teams what should they do. But the only thing that they can do is to retranslate the same macro task that they received from executives. See? So they expect like junior, middle, and senior engineers to understand on their own what must be done. Well, this is their task. Understand very deeply, decompose it to micro instructions, and then assign these micro instructions to um, to performance, right? It, it all end up that the infrastructure teams and the company is formally created, but since this crack in misunderstanding of people in different domains of what they should deliver, they fail to onboard and um, instruct their teams appropriately. So in a, like three, four, five, six months, the costs were spent, the salaries were paid, but where is the product? The product will be in exact same state as it was six months ago. More precisely, nowhere. See? So the teams sitting on their chairs and expecting, um, and this is their full right, they expect clear micro instructions. See, the task they, they were given to abstract, they don't know what to do. They just sit and wait, maybe play some PUBG. Maybe talk to their like um, uh, friends, maybe scroll Facebook, this is what they do. Okay. Uh, now, it was a conceptual explanation, and now is a real story. A real story which happened exactly according to this scenario, and we observed it uh, in some uh, business communications. So, the company idea was to create virtual drug development platform in precision medicine. Great idea. This is a good time for it. And um, if they do it properly and in time, they can uh, occupy a large part of a market because now it's not filled. There is a very small competition. This company started on March, uh, almost a half year ago. Uh, initial team included one CEO. He hired four directors and the directors, last time I spoke to them, they had two team members. So a total, uh, six people in the team. Those team members also were seniors. So um, we will round it up and it will be six directors. 
Yep. Current project status uh, after six months of work. MVP, no MVP. POC, no POC. Database schema, they didn't develop database schema. Detailed roadmap, they don't know what they are going to do step by step. Development team, part of the team were hired, but then they understood that they don't know what to do. So they even stopped hiring. And uh, I think that the set of people was inappropriate. They simply, the people they hired, they just, they cannot deliver the product they want. And now let's compute approximate uh, project investments. Uh, average director salary in the country where this um, company resides is about almost uh, 100,000 bucks uh, per year. So six uh, director level uh, people in six months got almost $300,000 uh, of salary and uh, excluding payroll taxes. So I expect the cost of the project, like as you see, the project is a big sarcasm here because they did nothing in a half a year. So they just wasted uh, 300,000 bucks, expect like around and wasted half a year. This is the real example of the situation uh, I just described. So what should you do to avoid with, with this issue? Simply remember two rules. If you're an expert in the both domain and technology, do it. If you are not expert, don't do it. Very simple. See, I mentioned Greg Landrum here because this is a brilliant example of a genius who, who was both competent in chemistry, like a god, and in software development. And he created amazing thing, RDKit, which we all use and love. Chapter number three, loud names, low quality technologies. Loud names attract people, especially uh, US citizens. They love hype, they love loud things. Um, they are all e very easily attracted to that. But first, uh, before the story, I have to give you a bit of a context. So let's make a step aside and talk about open source program for molecular docking. It's called Autodoc Vina. And it is very old. It was, was invented in Scripps Research Institute in 1989, more than 30 years ago. It was updated multiple times and uh, many people use it. And it is still pretty popular. Uh, it is fine, it is great achievement. I don't have anything like, against it. And for um, creating a pose of a molecule, it is sometimes works. But recently, about a year ago or a bit more, we were working on a study, uh, which uh, you can see here. It was published uh, in uh, Elsevier. Uh, the name is Ensembling Machine Learning Models to Boost Molecular Affinity Prediction. We tried to use Autodoc Vina as a reference for our neural networks. And, and this is a link to a research. Yeah, feel free to follow it. Uh, we tried to use Autodoc Vina as a, as a reference, as a baseline, you know, here is, here is what Vina predicts. And if we, we will do better, then most likely um, our tool is at least um, to some extent better than Vina. It will be some moderate success, but we need something to reference to. But when we took KMBL, uh, we took um, we wanted to test Vina uh, before use, right? We started to create a benchmark. Uh, we selected a set of compounds with known Ki. Ki is an inhibition constant. It is uh, used to describe um, a molecular um, binding affinity of a ligand to a receptor. The lower Ki, the stronger 
the association. Now let's take a look what is on this chart. Um, in, uh, in red, you see compounds that are non-binders. They do not bind with receptors. The, the, the binding affinity and the strength of association is too low. So they are non-active compounds. While the blue ones are binders. These are compound, compounds that <clears throat> interact strongly with the receptor. Uh, do you see separation? No. There were no separation. It means that autodoc vena fails to predict molecular binding. Um, and feel free to read more about this case in the blog post. Here is a link to it. Now, <clears throat> let's finish this uh, step aside uh, context. Now you know a bit about autodoc vena. Let's get back to our scene number three, allowed names, low quality technologies. And let's consider an example. This is a, one of the many example. I don't talk about the rest. I'm. I picked only one, just as a very declarative. What is the issue? The issue is that people tend to follow famous researchers or institutions without deep understanding of the matter, methods, and results. So they see, um, in our case, we will consider a paper from uh, MIT. We all know that MIT is the top computer science university and research institution in the world. So if you see something from Cambridge, most likely it is good. <laughs> and this is the paper, Equibind. Um, it is very fresh. Uh, it is uh, 2022. Uh, it's geometric deep learning, one of the hottest uh, current topic in uh, <clears throat> drug discovery. Uh, here is the link uh, on the archive to, uh, to this um, publication. Um, briefly, the concept. Okay, so, so yeah, we have a like cool institution, top-notch researchers, great topic. Here is a technology. Uh, here is a ligand receptor. Um, they take our kit, creating a, a random conformer from a ligand, uh, then they somehow encode a receptor structure, put all of that into the neural network, graph neural network, and it gives you pose and conformation of this ligand on this receptor. It is called blind flexible docking. Blind, because we don't pick a location of a ligand on a surface of a receptor. The program gives it automatically. Flexible because initial uh, conformation um, of a ligand has been changed. It was optimized to fit uh, uh, the binding surface in a perfect manner. The best th that uh, we could uh, to geometrically optimize it. Great idea, great idea. Uh, so we have all the set of like hype world, words. Um, we have geometric, deep learning, predicting structure, drug binding, all hype words we have. We have proof that it works. And here are the details. We become even more excited, wow cool technology, ligand, random confirmer, a lot of math, see graphs, uh, information, message passing from node to node. Wow. Uh, even uh, looks like here we have here attention mechanism because we have information transferred between like receptor graph and ligand graph. See multi-head attention, cool, top-notch technology. And then we have final complex. 
exactly as we've been promised uh, in the short description. After this, we all want to build a startup. Take this paper, reimplement the paper and make money. except through specialists, because they don't only look at the pictures, they read the papers. And if we read the paper, actually see here is the table. So if we read it more precisely with more attention, we will understand that this equibind is just proposes us uncorrected, chemically unplausible molecules. It means chemical garbage. It throws everything at you. Then you have another thing that filters it. Okay, we don't use it. We don't, yes, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Oh, this is fine, good. So it throws chemical garbage, <clears throat> but not at receptor. What? It predicts approximate ligand position. So on the receptor surface, it simply predicts a point where it will locate its chemical garbage. And then, and now remember the context I gave you a little bit before about autodoc vena and that it fails to predict binding force, remember? So now they use autodoc vena for their chemical garbage outputs and expected approximate um, initial position of a ligand. So actually all the job, all the trick does existing uh, outsourcing like a freeware technology autodoc vena. Okay, this is the half of a disaster. Another half of a disaster is a precision with which they predict this initial point. It is plus minus eight angstrom. What is it, guys? Eight, eight angstrom is like maybe on this side, maybe on that side. Moreover, here is the um, one of the add-ons to Vina is called Smina. The Smina alone, without there this huge ugly thing without all these complications it can do the same exactly the same blind docking but with a precision like 12 angstroms so all this stuff gives you only like four angstroms better and to sum up what this thing does it creates chemical garbage, throws it uh, approximately into autodoc with average accuracy of 8.2 angstroms, and it beats autodoc alone without this thing only by four angstrom. Okay, now you think that creating a startup using this Open source code is maybe not that good idea, and you're right. So congratulations, you've just got a level up, a professional level up, and learned extremely useful lesson, do not trust anyone. Chapter number four, bad data. Actually, all public um, biological data is bad, unfortunately. Why? First, because nobody shares good data, because this is a competitive advantage. So if you decided to implement your great idea on public data, be ready. So bad data destroys your PSC. Let's consider how. First, there are discrepancies 
between in silico, in vitro, in vivo, and measurement environments. This one is very simple. In silico is emulation, is a model of the world. In vitro uh, are experimental studies in model organism, mice, cells, etc., etc. So model environment is an oversimplification of the world. Um, if you, if anybody familiar with the molecular dynamics, you know that you can do a study in a vacuum, in a water, or in any other solvent, right? This is a good approximation of a reality, but still, our blood, where all this, most of this interaction happens, is not water, is not other solvent, right? It's a biological solution of proteins, micro and macro elements, fats, sugars, a lot of stuff. It doesn't look like any modeled environment. So uh, interactions in the modeled environment and in our blood, which we want all the stuff to work, will be different. Same is actual for in vitro studies. Um, we know a lot of stuff that worked in cockroaches, but didn't work in people because they have you know, different uh, organisms, different bodies, different organs. Um, and the same is related to measurement environments. Measurement environments is place where we took our data. If we will think about the structure of proteins, there are a number of methods uh, for measurement of the structure. There are Raman spectroscopy, uh, there are NMR, uh, there are um, electronic microscopy, um, and uh, many more. But, uh, for example, Raman spectroscopy works with crystals. It can give you a structure of coordinates. Coordinates, uh, I mean, X, Y, Z, special 3D coordinates of atom in a substance. To create this structure, you need a crystal. Now let's think about how you measure a structure of amino acids. Before you do any measurements, you have to create a crystal. How you create a crystal? You have a solution of amino acids, and then you have to do something so that they become crystals. It means, uh, and there are a number of methods. First, you regulate the pH of a solution so that all molecules of amino acids become uncharged. So their total charge of every amino acid is, should be zero. Usually, it is achieved in an uh, acid, acid pH, something near 5.5. And then you lower temperature, and uh, then they all fall down uh, in the form of crystal, and then uh, you measure the uh the coordinates question for you you have all this fancy stuff receptor ligand um, molecules uh, ligands that stick to the surface of a receptor experimentally measured data question for you where they were measured in crystals all of them are crystal measurements does it look like your body? No. Obviously, you're not a crystal, right? Your body is a liquid. Uh, your blood I mean, is a liquid. Uh, and more, its pH is not 5.5. If it is, like, I have bad news for you. What it means? It means the structures that are on that public database, like MOADB, um, binding DB, PDB, they are all skewed. They are crystals. Your blood, not a crystal. So thinking that the stuff binds in the same way as it was measured is a big, big approximation. Of course, we have a discrepancy and a, a space for errors. Um, okay, it was what related to discrepancies between in silico, in vitro, in vivo, and measurement environments. I explained you what is in silico, like modeling of environment, what is in vitro, 
uh, is a study um, experimental environment like cells or mice and in vivo, which is actually a human body or target organism, um, target organism environment. And also how we measure that, how we measure the crystals and other stuff. Then uh, the measurement itself were carried out in different decades by different methods, different scientists and on different equipment. Um, I will talk about it in more details right now. Uh, for the historical consistency, I will tell you that there are also maybe human errors, like somebody broke the pill uh, and other things. Um, and also the nature is very complicated. We don't know. We don't know a full picture of nature, almost in, in any field. Every field is just approximation. Physics is approximation. Uh, biology, we know a part, right? But we still don't know where our consciousness comes from, for example, and who we are. So the nature itself is very complicated, and it is hard to describe it. And if you cannot describe it, you cannot parameterize it. And this is what we want to do. If we want to predict properties, we have to parameterize the objects that we are going to work with. And until we did that reliably, it is hard to expect any good results and we still fail. Having all that in mind, let's get back to different decades of measurements. A good example of a, a huge timeline of a record is USPTO. USPTO is United States Patent and Trademark Office. It's a set of patent um, of US uh, office. Yeah. Here is a, it's a landing page. Uh, this database contains patents issued from uh, 1976 to the present in form of text and PDF images of all patents from uh, 1790 to present time. This, why I'm talking about this data set? Because this data set serves as a benchmark uh, for um, predicting chemical yield uh, in case of a multi-reaction class data set. It, it means your data set consists reactions that represent different mechanisms and different reaction classes. Cool? Cool. But who measured that? Can we expect that a, a 30 years experience a professor working in the lab does experiments with the same accuracy that his Chinese colleague that just arrived from, um, I don't know, some a few weeks ago? No, maybe he did some mistakes. And there are thousands of that. We don't know how people work. We don't know their methods. So all of that results in the best public result on this data set to be R square of 0 0.388. It is below 0 0.5. It is unreliable. People did a lot of studies, a lot of models, tried to do this and that and generate features and neural networks and fat neural networks and birds and graphs and all the stuff. <coughs> and all of that didn't help. We tried to repeat it. Here is our recent publication uh, of uh, which is called Advancing Molecular Graphs. So we took molecular graphs, uh, parameters, parameterized atoms and bonds, and added some chemical descriptors to them, hoping to extend the picture of the world for the model. So it gets more information and it is capable of pre better prediction of yield. And here is the conceptual scheme of the model. And uh, it didn't work on USPTO. It worked on other data sets that were more carefully selected, but on USPTO, it didn't work. We didn't get better results. What it says? It says that the data itself is noisy, dirty. And whatever the module you take, 
it will not give you good results because this is not the problem of the model. <clears throat> so conclusions, high quality data is always almost private. Nobody will share, will share good data with you, as I told you before, this is because this is a competitive advantage. Second conclusion, public data is almost always crap, except the cases where kind-hearted researchers really did a good job and shared with people for the future of mankind. There are such people, big respect to them. Uh, what should you do? Get your own lab, do experiments, have a one team, one equipment, one methods, and uh, consistent measurements. And be happy because science is fun. Um, it concludes my report for today. Uh, the last um, thing I wanted to say is that we have to repeat uh, 1812, please. Now, time for questions. Alex, thank you for your speech. So the main question is actually about the data. Is there any chance or any way to get better data, more quality data to at least uh, running an experiment and to get something above the R square zero five? On USPTO? Yeah. Um, we, you can try to split it uh, to do data stratification, split it into uh, one reaction mechanism. First of all, there will be hundreds of classes. And then within each classes, try to separate clusters and uh, do your prediction on, a, on these clusters rather than on all data. Uh, you will end up with uh, like hundreds of models, but I see this as the only way. OK, I understand. And is there any? From your practice, is there any um, data you have uh, used that are reliable, uh, like from the public data? Uh, we know that the PDB data set is uh, more or less reliable. Uh, the core set, there are, um, they did a very good job <clears throat> by doing extended data set, then uh, a, a core and um, multiple refined sets, and you can find uh, what you need, and it serves nowadays as a baseline for different um, biologically related um, researches. Okay, thank you for the answer. And the last question is, what is your take on visualization tools used for clustering genomics data? The question is from um, Shakya. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Um, I think I think Dmitro is uh, the person who can advise you. Ah, yeah, we, yeah. Oh, apologies. Um, yeah, I think it is dependent on the on the task you are doing. Because if you are doing like uh, up down regulation of genes, for example, then this is one visualization. If you're trying to build a sequence of mechanisms. This is another visualization. Yeah, but we know the tools uh, for these cases. Um, what are the tools? Do they make, make sense? Um, so as I saw, they, they work fine on the data set they've been uh, created on. It's a sync as far as I know. L, 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 and L1000. Ah, CAG. It's a CAG data set. And they don't work on others. They don't generalize because they are built on a, a bit primitive technology like PCA under the hood and some K-means clustering that disappointed me. Okay, so I hope it answers the question. The tool uh, is called VGCNA. Or and the Ronto tools. Well, basically, this tool just extracts information. Yeah, but and visualization can be di different. Uh, and yeah, you are right. It's basically the best way if you want to perform visualization to do it like with some cake based 
it just works better with it. Uh, but, uh, and if you want just to visualize your data after complexity reduction, Disney kind of works, but uh, oh, it, works, it works okay. Uh, it's not the best way, but it's like, maybe it's the best way, it's not the perfect way. You know, if you, if you, have, if you want to, to do like to view and like uh, complexity data reduction to perform the task. And as some of the encoders probably has to provide quite good results like this, this Latin space. And you, can, you can try it too. Uh, I think that this question is to Alec. Could you spell the tool name once again? Dutro, please help us. You are like more familiar with this. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not ready right now to, to establish tool you can use to visualize uh, like uh, for pathways uh, and affect affected pathways. Actually, uh, site escape you can use to like uh, when you are working with gene sets. Uh, for example, this model is generated by VGCNA, uh, and, you, you, and it's quite easy. You, it has like website. It's like cyto c y t o and escape. Can like you can you type it in the chat, please? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll type it. Thank you. Okay, so I'll I'll post it to the YouTube directly. Thank you for the question.